Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist and today we'll be reaching into my case files and I'll be sharing with you one of my favorite cases that I've come across during my experience as an oral pathologist. But first, the disclaimer. Just a reminder that all the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone and do not represent any of the organizations through which I am employed or a member. And also just a reminder that this video is meant for educational purposes only and not as medical advice. Should you have any questions about your oral health, please reach out to your nearest oral health care provider. And with that, let's talk about today's case. So first, I do have to explain that I didn't quite see this case. It happened right before I started my residency, but I do need to give a shout out to the recent residents from my program that graduated before me, Drs. Jenny Eisen, uh, Joseph Kubiak, Kathleen Schultz, Dave Chandra, and Aaron Yankoski. I'm not quite sure who documented this case, um, but it definitely got passed down and shared with me, and I'm really glad that it was because it is my favorite case, and I'm excited to share it with you. So this case is a uh, Hispanic male, in the third or fourth decade of life that reported to a nearby oral surgery residency program, Nassau University Medical Center's uh, oral surgery program. And thankfully the residents there did a great job documenting the clinical features of this case as well. And the uh, patient presented with a swelling in the lip. So let's take a look at how the patient presented. So as you can appreciate in this uh, closed mouth picture, the patient clearly has facial asymmetry with a focal swelling of the left face right above the commissure, um, closer to the vermilion border of the upper lip and the remainder of the facial skin. This clinical photograph of a retracted upper lip shows a sessile lesion of the upper labial mucosa. Sessile means that it's a bump, but it has a flat base as opposed to pedunculated, which is on a stalk. Now, when we see this type of lesion, we can start to come up with a differential diagnosis. The first thing that you wanna think about is a fibroma. Fibroma is by far the most common bump that we see in the oral cavity. One thing to consider about fibroma most of them occur in areas of occlusion, meaning where the teeth come together. The thing to think about here is that our teeth are set such that the top teeth hang over the bottom teeth, which means a lot of trauma occurs to the lower lip and to the cheeks, not necessarily to the upper lip. But that being said, we still do see fibromas in the upper lip. Another consideration would be a mucosal. But again, I have some mentors in the profession that would argue that mucoseals never happen in the upper labial mucosa because a mucoseal is extravasation or letting loose of saliva inside the tissue due to damage to the duct. The argument is that ducts in the upper lip don't get damaged or have a much more difficult time getting damaged than those of the lower lip where the teeth are more likely to bite it or it's more likely to interfere with food or other traumatic processes. Other items on the differential diagnosis includes the angiolyomyoma, which is a benign tumor of smooth muscle that we see on the outside of vessels like arteries and veins, and also salivary gland tumors. Monomorphic adenomas and pleomorphic adenomas, which are benign salivary gland tumors, do like to occur in the upper lip. So, Obviously, since it's an interesting case, it probably isn't anything towards the top of the differential, right? But this case really goes to show the importance of biopsying. So, very wisely, that's what the surgeons in this case did. Now here's a very interesting photo of the gross specimen or whole specimen that we got in our biopsy bottle. We can kind of see two pieces, one of which on the left side of the screen is kind of like a floating lining and on the right side we can see this red thing with a line running down the sort of sort of center maybe towards the back that's going to come into play when we look at it under the microscope here we have the histologic section of that specimen that was inside the lip and we can see a really thick and fibrotic outer cystic lining and then inside we can see kind of a collection of of winding 
canal-like spaces that have kind of a pinkish fuzzy border around it. On higher power, perhaps we can appreciate that that more fuzzy pink border that is creating these more canal-like or maybe serpiginous or snake-like channels kind of has a ciliated look to it. We can also appreciate a lot of these more hole-like spaces uh, around the outside of this. So what could this lesion be? Well, remember that line running down the backside of the grow specimen? It's actually a notochord. In that really kind of fuzzy pink snake-like area, that's actually a digestive tract. This is a case of sister psychosis. Sister psychosis is the deposition of tenia solium larva, which are actually the larva that get give rise to tapeworms. I find this graph from the CDC very helpful. In most developed nations, a human will get a tapeworm by eating infected meat. In this diagram, it's a pig. So in this life cycle, the pig consumes contaminated water, the teniosolum larvae travel to the muscle of the pig. If the pig's muscle or meat is not fully cooked, then the human consumes that infected muscle and the larvae kind of hatches inside of our intestines and gives rise to the adult tapeworm. We then excrete that tapeworm back into water, which can later infect more pigs and thus the cycle continues. So interestingly enough, in our case, the patient is actually serving in substitute of the pig. So the patient consumed contaminated water and then the tenia solium larvae traveled to that patient's muscle in the upper lip and made a home. Now, sister psychosis is very interesting because it doesn't always just go to muscle. It can also go to eyes and even the brain. And sometimes the brain x-rays or films or CTs or MRIs, whatever's taken of those patients, are very impressive. Now, in this case, this patient emigrated from a Central American country with less sophisticated water filtration techniques. In most developed nations, we won't see this occurring. But in developing nations that uh, may not have the same infrastructure, this may occur. So I don't have all of the follow-up with this case because I do admit that it was passed down to me, but it was so cool that I knew that I had to share it with you. It also really emphasizes the importance of doing a biopsy to get a diagnosis. You never wanna assume that you know what something is until it's looked at under the microscope. But for most patients with cystic psychosis, the treatment includes an antiparasitic medication and occasionally surgical removal of cysts because the cysts may remain dormant even after the antiparasitic medication. So there you have it, a crazy case from my case files. There will be plenty more to come in the future, so make sure that you subscribe to this channel and stay tuned and be well.